All right, let's get started. This is your Libertarian Crusaders episode number 42. And today we have the great David Freeman, uh, my co-host Kurt. And I always enjoy my talks with you, Mr. Freeman, uh, especially at a Students for Liberty conference or when I see you at uh, Porkfest many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you live a very in crazy, I would say like, like the stories I hear from like Pensick or these other battles are amazing. Um, and you have posted recently a lot of interesting uh, insights, I would say, towards your thoughts on the election and mm -hmm. possibly like what is to come. And that's like, it's been an, a jittery week for a lot of people, uh, to put a nice- well, I would have to say, looking back on it, that the election seems to be turning out about as well as I could reasonably have hoped for assuming that the Democrats don't get both Senate seats in Georgia, which I don't think is very likely on the runoffs that's going to happen, you're going to end up with divided government, that what I was actually afraid of was that you would end up with one party controlling the White House and both houses of Congress. And if that happened, it would probably have been the Democrats, but given how unreliable it was pretty clear the polling was, it could conceivably have been so far off that it was the Trump uh, uh, landslide, in which case they could have ended up, and either way, I, since, since my assumption is that both parties on the whole want to do bad things from my standpoint, just different bad things, that I figured that having divided government was about the best we could hope for. Uh, and in addition to that, I think a lot of the results are a significant rebuke to the parts of the Democratic Party that I most don't like. That is, you know, I have nothing against Biden. He probably has no principles of his own, just as Trump probably has no principles of his own. And he takes whatever positions look as though they're politically successful at a, at a given time. And he was under a lot of pressure from his left uh, and therefore said, came out in favor of various bad things that I hope don't happen. But it looks to me as though the response of the Democratic Party is, wait a minute, the result of talking about defunding the police and riots in the cities and such was that we had expected to gain seats in the house and we lost them we had expected to take the senate back and it looks like we haven't taken the senate back we had expected to win by a landslide and we did win but it was a moderately tight election uh, and that that may hopefully result in in less uh less uh, enthusiasm for the sort of progressive woke uh, agenda which is something that i don't much like uh, and in addition, it looks at this point as though Trump did substantially better with minority voters than previous Republican Party vote candidates. And quite aside from the outcome of the election, it seems to me that a situation where, you, where if you look at somebody's skin, you know which way he's going to vote is not a very healthy situation. And that it's, it is probably better for both the country and the minority groups to have them seen as in play, so to speak, as people who could go either way than to have seen them seen as sort of safe voters for one party or the other. So anyway, it seemed to me, now I have to admit, I was sort of looking forward for a while during the early stages of the election to the agony of people I disapprove of if Trump had gotten reelected. But I wasn't really looking forward to Trump being president for another four years. I don't think he's a particularly uh, attractive character. Uh, and, you know, Biden, I, you know, in himself, I think is pretty harmless, uh, but we will see. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a lot to unpack there. I mean, you did make a good mention and like, you can't really look at the skin color, who they vote for. Cause you look at uh, you know, majority of new England are generally uh, white and they yes. overwhelmingly for, for Biden. Um, yeah, apparently Trump did less the one group Trump did less well with than his first election were white males. Just uh, the opposite of the sort of claim that's being made about him by his opponents. There is an interesting chart that shows, however, uh, maybe you can look at gender, because they do show that if it's just males voted, it would have gone to a uh, Republican. If it's just women that voted, it would have gone straight to a uh, party. But, 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 but that doesn't tell you, that, that fact by itself doesn't tell you very much. Because look, if 1% of the voters in every state had switched their vote from Biden to Trump, Trump would have won. I'm pretty sure that's true. I haven't done the arithmetic. Because right. right, that would be a two percentage point change, one of them gaining, one of them losing. Well, the question of if, 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 if 
if, 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 if men are 51-49 for Trump and women are 51-49 for Biden, that tells you very little about how divided the country is, that these are sort of knife edge, edge effects. What the real numbers are, I don't know. My point is only, the same thing is true about who won the election, that various people are saying, various people who very much didn't want Trump to win are not only saying I'm relieved that Trump didn't win, they're saying I'm relieved that the country is not as terrible a place as I thought it was. Well, whether 50% or 49% of the voters support Trump doesn't tell you very much about whether the country is a terrible place. So I think everybody puts too much weight on these sort of symbolic victories. Uh, anyway. The, right. I think I remember uh, when Trump was coming in and I had professors when I was going to university was talking about like he's going to lock up, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. Yes, all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, no, I think if, if COVID hadn't happened, Trump would almost certainly have won. Right. And very likely he would have taken the House as well. And uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm sure there have been other elections where accidental things, that, that there's a sense in which since voters don't really have enough information uh, to make a adequate decision about who is better. They often use as a proxy, how are things going at the moment? Uh, and it's not a very good proxy because how things are going at the moment depends on lots of things other than the president, but it may be the best they've got. And COVID looks bad and that's a reason not to vote for Trump, even though he has nothing to do with it. I mean, the other side tried to claim it was all his fault, but that was not very plausible. If right. you look at the differences in outcomes across countries it looks as though what the government does doesn't ha isn't a very major determinant of whether things go badly or, or well. Uh, but, but nonetheless, the fact that bad things were happening on his watch made him, made people feel as though, uh, it made some people less willing to vote for him and, and it didn't take a very large swing to determine it. But you know, one of the questions I've been, been wondering about, and I had a post on Facebook recently, is what I was thinking of as Trump Mark II that suppose you're, a pol you're an aspiring politician and you say to yourself, Trump clearly did some things very right because look at all the votes he got from people who never voted for Republicans before. He also did some things very wrong because look at all the Republicans who didn't vote for him, the traditional Republicans. How can I get the things he did right, right without getting the things he did wrong, right? And I'm not sure what the answer is because some of what helped with some people hurt with others. If you think about the sort of general attitude of when people say bad things about me, I will ferociously attack them. And some people say, well, he's not a civilized person. You, you ought to have, you know, rational conversation with people, not say horrible things about them. If you think about, for example, uh, the way he won the nomination originally, where he was generally being contemptuous of all the other candidates. A different set of people say, ah, oh, that's a real man. I mean, you know, they push him, he pushes back, you know. No. And so you're getting votes from one group and losing them with another. And the question is, are there ways that you could get most of the gains without the losses? And, and we'll see. And right. it wouldn't even have to be a Republican. It's more likely a Republican, but I could imagine a Democrat who, who picks up, as it were, on the same tactical or strategic political devices and copies them. Yeah, because I've, I've seen Trump uh, speak uh, before he was president when he was just doing real estate and very, yeah. you know, patient, uh, you know, long conversations. And I think, I guess when you come into this role of being president of America, right, not like uh, Belize or anything like that, mm -hmm. you got to think bigger than life. You got to think, yeah, like alpha country. Uh, you can't push us around sort of thing. Um, but but, but when, he, when he was running for the election, you know, years ago... Uh, I attend. I, I, I was a guest on a radio talk show program of somebody I knew. Didn't know him well, but I knew him. And I was struck by how much less pleasant a person he was on the air. Hmm. And it was pretty clear that what was going on was that uh, having sort of polite conversations and trying to understand the other person's argument and dealing with it is an intellectually honest way of behaving, but it's not very good theater. Right. Whereas putting down the callers who you disagree with uh, and sort of being rude and confident and arrogant probably gets more listeners. Right. And that was what I thought was going on, that he had adapted his. And somebody, I think maybe it was a Facebook conversation or a conversation somewhere online with somebody who I think had had a, had had a talk radio show and was saying the same thing, that basically what, what she was told by the people running the show 
was that she should change her behavior in what, from my standpoint, was a less attractive way in order to should be more one-sided. Uh, anyway, and but but presumably most politicians, in some sense, figure out what persona they want to portray and they'll get them votes. And and it's just it's just the whole thing is interesting because Trump is noticeably different from most politicians, and yet he did on the whole surprisingly well, even though he seems to have finally lost in the second round. Uh, <clears throat> and what, you know, what, what interesting things does that tell us? But, but there are lots of other things. There's, there was a piece by Andrew Sullivan, and I'm not sure it's right or not, but it was, I found it fairly convincing. And he's citing someone who apparently has been looking at exit polls and other information. And his claim is that if you ask people whether letting it be known who, which candidate you're supporting would hurt them professionally. Many more Republicans say that than Democrats. And by his account, the pollsters got the worst results for college educated voters. That is his claim was that college educated voters on, on the exit polls split about 50-50, whereas the pollsters basically said they're all going for Biden. And so the conjecture was that because of the sort of social pressure to be in favor, to be anti-racist and in favor of Black Lives Matter and, and to hate Trump and all the rest of that, people who were in the kind of circles where that social pressure existed uh, kept their mouths shut and either didn't either lied to the pollsters or maybe more likely just didn't answer polls and therefore got undercounted. Anyway, that was an interesting observation, right? Because I've seen, it doesn't affect me at all. That is, I spent 20 some years at a university which was run by the Jesuits, where the two ideologies of the university pretty clearly were Catholicism and soft leftism. Mm. They were all in favor of sort of environmentalist, sustainability, all that sort of stuff. And I never had any problem that as far as I could tell, they were, you know, tolerant people. They, I, I did not conceal the fact that I disagreed with both of those ideologies and it was never a problem. But there are clearly a lot of people for whom it is. I mean, I'm seeing it mostly in online discussions of people who work in uh, Silicon Valley and high tech firms and basically say, say, well, you know, I'm a conservative or I'm a libertarian, but of course I don't tell anybody that because everybody would hate me. Right. Uh, and <laughs> How common that is, I don't know. And people worry about Twitter mobs. And again, you know, people may be exaggerating because if, you know, if, if one person gets mobbed out of a thousand, he's the one you hear about. Uh, but I think there is a noticeable feeling, at least among people I'm seeing online who are either libertarian or conservative, uh, or even probably people who are liberals, but liberals who don't go along with all of the current orthodoxy, uh, that it is prudent to keep your head down, as it were. Right. When I was, I, was, I was a Harvard undergraduate in 1964 when Goldwater ran, and the Crimson did a poll, and they eventually found that 19% of the voters supported Goldwater. And I was astonished it was that high, because I would have said there were about nine students at Harvard who supported Goldwater, and I knew all of them. Uh, and I think it was the same phenomenon, that, that if you were a Goldwater supporter, and did not really like arguing with people, you, your, your friends might know, but you didn't sort of, you didn't wear a button. You didn't make it obvious to people that which, which, one, which side you were on. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think uh, recently uh, AOC just uh, started talking about making a list of anyone, right. a Trump supporter, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And so It'll be a long list. Robert Reich, I think, is also on this bandwagon. You know, he's the most excellent economist there is. So right. He can he can make a good list, I'm sure. <laughs> I think that Trump really kind of uh, helped people overcome the bystander effect of, you know, he has that arrogantness and people that were on the sidelines, he did bring out some. But like you say, he disaffected a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's also a huge section of people, I think, that are probably going to be pretty disillusioned with the whole selection process. So, you know, there's got to be some avenues to reach out to them because Jeff Dice always says those people, they're not vanquished. They still exist in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, and I think also that the 
media, that people like the New York Times have burned a fair amount of reputational capital at this point. That is that my guess is that anybody who was conservative 20 years ago, almost anybody, any reasonable educated conservative, thought of the New York Times as they're biased against us, but they're basically, you know, a respectable paper. And, and at this point, I think people of that sort are much less likely to feel that way, that there have been enough cases, partly the, the attempt to suppress the whole Biden, uh, Hunter Biden laptop story, where it's, I think at this point, it is pretty clear that there was good evidence, not that uh, Joe Biden had done anything illegal, but that he had been lying about his relationship to his son's business activities during a point when he was himself out of power in particular. <clears throat> and they just didn't want that story to appear. And so the result is you could find it, but you weren't likely to find it if you were reading this sort of mainline press. And the whole business where uh, a, a senator writes an op-ed arguing that if the riots get bad enough, you should call in the National Guard, basically. And the New York Times runs it. And the New York Times staff objects to their running it. And the op-ed editor who chose to run it ends up being forced out of the paper. And that sort of stuff. What a bunch of that was reminding me of was The Fountainhead, assuming you've read The Fountainhead, that one of the sort of subplots in The Fountainhead is the inability of the capitalist who owns a newspaper to control it because the villain has basically indoctrinated the staff with his views and therefore the staff uh, won't go along with the owner's uh, correct position, as it were, on the controversy that's going on at that point in the book. And I was reminded of that. And, and I'm wondering whether, if, if it's the case, as, as I think it is, that the mainline Democrats believe that the uh, progressive wing has seriously hurt them in this election, whether the result of that will be that the senior staff people in the New York Times respond to that kind of pressure with, if you don't like it, leave, rather than going along with it. But I'm not sure that'll happen. But it's, they're sort of interesting non-political, as it were, elements of this whole thing of the sort of that wokeism is sort of a new fundamentalist religion, and it's got a lot of the energy of fundamentalist religions, but it's also got some, some problems. And, you know, it's, uh, as you may know, uh, Mark Twain estimated that by, I think, 1920, if I remember correctly, the uh, Christian scientists would have a majority of Congress. And he was extrapolating from how rapid their growth was in, I guess, what, the late 19th century, I think, or, or somewhere around there when he was looking. And hopefully this is gonna be the case of wokeism as well, that for a while it's, you know, it's the fashionable thing and it spreads and it can beat up on people who don't go along with it, but I'm not at all sure it's gonna last. And I suspect, though I may be wrong, that this election is going to weaken it substantially, but we'll see. Right. I think uh, one good thing I think Trump did is uh, bring out how much uh, the media does lie. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of it's always been true. The, I guess, from my standpoint, sort of a very, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not always clear what's lying, what's just not thinking. Fallacy uh, of omission. They always leave out just enough. But, but sometimes, it's, sometimes it's not deliberate. Let me give you the, an example from the Wall Street Journal. A very low, they convinced me that the editorial pages were more or less on our side, but the news wasn't particularly. And this is a long, long time ago. There's a Wall Street Journal story on the adoption market. And they're looking at the fact that here at various times, there are a bunch of kids who can't find adoptive parents, or there are a bunch of people who want to adopt and can't adopt. And they look at the failure of the market. They never mentioned the fact that this is a market with a legal price fixed at zero, right? It, it was and is illegal to pay the natural mother for her permission to adopt a child. Right, right. Uh, well, under those circumstances, it's not surprising if when you have price control at a price of zero, uh, you discover that there is a, uh, imbalance between quantity supplied and quantity. I don't think that was a deliberate attempt to bias anything. I think it was that the writers didn't know any economics and it just didn't occur to them. Uh, but there are other cases. The other, the, the even, in a sense, more striking case, which I suspect probably was not politics, but just wanting to make a good story, was when I think it was Time Magazine, quote my father, quoted my father as saying, we're all Keynesians now. 
What he actually said was, there is one sense in which we're all Keynesians now and another sense in which none of us are Keynesians. That is to say that Keynes had affected the way economists thought about a certain set of issues, but the, the particular answers Keynes had, had, had given through, through that effect uh, were probably not right. But having the most prominent anti-Keynesian say we're all Keynesians now makes a much better uh, cover story or whatever they did with it uh, than uh, the, the more subtle uh, statement. So anyway, the, no, I think the media have never been very good. And I think their strongest bias is not political. I think their strongest bias is wanting to make it a good story. Uh, but they often have political biases as well. Right. I think uh, I saw like it was a great Mary Shelley moment with CNN creating all this uh, wokeness and saying like white people are racist and all that stuff. And then you have Black Lives Matter storm a CNN headquarters in Atlanta, like Frankenstein's monster coming to uh, destroy the creator. Um, and given uh, what we know about the media and all the way that they've acted in the past few years, and you look at uh, this week and how like quick they are to say Biden won and kind of you know, it's without like election results, all, all the tally was coming in. Do you well, think but they, I don't think they were. That is at least when I was watching it, as far as I could tell until yesterday, I don't think any major media said he had won. They said states. Uh, what? For, for certain states. Oh, particular states. But they were right. Well, I, even Arizona, they probably called too fast, but nonetheless, it looks as though he's going to win Arizona. Uh, what do you think? And, they mostly, now, it's a little odd that they didn't call Alaska, but Alaska gets its votes in really late, it turns out. And they presumably have some kind of a rule of thumb where they say you don't call it if <coughs> the gap is between the two candidates is substantially less than the number of votes still out. And uh, at that point, uh, like half the votes were still out. So even though the Republican had about twice the number of votes uh, for the Senate as the or I, don't know, I think it was for the Senate. I think it's also true for, for, for the presidency as the, as the Democrat, nonetheless, they weren't calling it. But, but no, I didn't, I didn't have that particular impression. The, the, you know, if you're, if you're an outsider watching, you, you tend to say, well, look, Trump is two percentage points up and they're 80% of the votes in, so they ought to be calling it for him. But presumably they knew what happened, which is it isn't random, that votes are coming in from one place faster than another. And in particular, I'm, Pennsylvania was a clear case. They knew that the votes that weren't in were largely from the Philadelphia area. They knew that that area is heavily Democratic. And therefore, even though Trump had quite a sizable lead in the early part, it wasn't astonishing that that lead eventually vanished. Wouldn't have been astonished if it didn't either. That is, it was a fairly close uh, election. Right. What do you think of um, in, in this scenario that um, now it's going to go towards uh, legal proceedings, right? Because um, it the constitution doesn't say like president presidency is elected by the media. Uh, Correct. It waits till like December 14 and the representative have to, uh, it, it waits, it waits until the electoral college meets. Right. right. So like, it's, so it's not over yet. Uh, but, well, but, but you, it isn't over yet, but I think the odds, look, the betting markets did pretty well. Right. Right. The betting markets did much better than the pollsters. They basically, up to, a, uh, uh, up to about a day before the election, what the betting markets were saying is the odds are with Biden, but not very much. It was about 60-40, I think, about two days before uh, the, 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 the election. And that described it much better than the 90-10 kind of figures that were what you were getting from the pollsters, I think. I think a lot of pollsters uh, are going to get fired. And <laughs> what do you think of... Uh, in, in a scenario that there is election fraud, um, mm -hmm. in a scenario where uh, Trump does find evidence and there is substantial enough for for that to happen, what, yes. what next? That goes to the Supreme Court, right? Or uh, well, it goes to some court. Which which court is going to go to is going to depend. That is, it mostly cases don't go initially to the Supreme Court. They go to some lower level court. Mm -hmm. At which point. The, low, the standard form in our system is for a federal case is it goes to a federal court. If the one of the sides doesn't like the result, they appeal to the appeals court. And the appeals court, I think, normally accepts all, all appeals. That is to say, it, it then looks at the case. And 
Imagine one saying, uh, we're now looking at this one. <laughs> and, but the Supreme Court doesn't. The Supreme Court looks at a small fraction of the cases they're sending. Right. So you don't know at what level we decided. And there's a certain sense in which if the, if the appeals court decides in one way and the federal court and the Supreme Court decides not to hear it, they're, letting the, they're making a decision and they're letting the existing case results stand. Uh, but it might go to the Supreme Court. But I think the idea that because a majority of the Supreme Court are now in some sense conservatives, therefore they can give the election to Trump is very unlikely. I think that in order for Trump to reverse the result, he's really going to have to have pretty serious evidence, either of fraud or mistakes. That is, you know, it's it's not inconceivable, though I think it's quite unlikely that somehow at some point in the process, a bunch of votes got counted twice or got missed entirely or whatever. But I think that would be surprising. I think the odds are now like 98% that the next president is going to be Biden. And as I say, I don't particularly mind that. I'd be I mind it if he has a if he has a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House, but that's not very likely at this point. Right. Um, if the uh, if Trump does win, uh, if, say the uh, the Supreme Court s- sides with him and he gets it, um, mm-hmm. what do you see uh, the next four years looking like under another second Trump uh, re-election presidency? Oh boy, I don't know. Uh, he presumably will continue to do both the things I dislike, well, which are basically his policies on trade and on immigration, hmm. and the things I like, which are appointing basically his subcontracted the job of selecting judges to the Federalist Society. And the Federalist Society are, from my standpoint, on the whole, good guys. Right. Uh, he has been more reluctant than previous presidents to get into foreign wars, and that's a good thing. Uh, he claims to be deregulating, and I'm not sure how true that is. I think it's hard to get a good count of it, so to speak. And I think it's probably true that there has been less increase in regulation than there has been under other administrations. But in what sense, you can't just count regulations because, you know, some of them have much larger effects than others. And I don't know whether it's literally true as he would claim that the total amount of regulation has gone down. Right. His thing was, uh, if you're going to create one regulation. Yeah, but how do you measure a regulation? Right. Right. I mean, if you do that, you just write broader regulations. So you get a smaller number of them with with a larger effect. But yeah, no. But the thing is, I don't think that Trump's rhetoric is consistently going to fit what he actually does. And uh, the... One of the online things I participate on has got several intelligent and reasonable Trump supporters, and they clearly have a much more favorable view of him than I do, although I don't think none of them, much or any of them have it unambiguously favorable. Uh, but, uh, but as they, my impression is that, that Trump's uh, unattractive features have been greatly exaggerated by his enemies, but they're really there, that he, he really, you know, he's been very unsuccessful at maintaining an, an organization that he keeps, you know, appointing people and then firing them. Uh, and, you know, a part of that is the problem that because he represents ideas that are out of power, there's not as big a stable of competent people, but still there are, you know, a lot of professional conservative Republican politicians who he could appoint to one cabinet position or another. And that's something, something that's something that, that, about uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Yeah, Andrew Jackson actually is more more like Trump than anybody else I can think of. It, right, right. That that he seems to have been a somewhat similar style. Uh, I don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. That his, I think his treatment of the Cherokee was pretty outrageous. He did adopt a Native American kid, though. What? He did adopt a Native American kid? Yep. Right. Not inconsistent. <laughs> that is. There was presumably political pressure to steal the land of a bunch of uh, Americans who were uh, who were Cherokee, right? And that pressure was such that he could take advantage of the sort of general tension, hostility between whites and Indians. Uh, but the result was a lot of people dying who hadn't done anything wrong, and I think that's to his discredit. Right. Uh, the there's a series, I think of alternate history novels done, I'm trying to remember the name of the author, it's one of the Bain authors, and Andrew Jackson is a character in those, and 
I've gotten a good deal of my impression of him from that. But uh, oh, he also reminds me, at least in that portrayal, of somebody I knew who who was somebody who I would describe as a sort of bully who, when you meet him, he pushes. And if you push back, you're fine. Right. But if you don't push back, you're a wimp and he doesn't push back you. Right. But my, my feeling was he was that kind of personality. I think that's the kind of personality you need. I think uh, him coming from like uh, Hollywood TV and uh, criticism from like Rosie O'Donnell and, and everyone. And if you're going to be like on the world stage, you're going to have a lot of pushback and you have to know how to like, just take it, but like, just shut out, you know? Um, Maybe, but, but, but there are, I suspect that there are a lot of successful politicians who are, who feel a lot less like that than Trump did. Right. Uh, who, who are, and even, I mean, Trump in a sense is ambiguous because if you look at his interactions with North Korea, there he's trying to make friends. Right. right? He doesn't, you could certainly imagine a, all, a, you know, Trump, a different version of Trump who says North Koreans are terrible. You know, if they don't do this, that, and that, we'll bomb them or we'll starve them or we'll do something to them. And that wasn't his reaction. Maybe uh, Teddy Roosevelt, big stick, as it were, yes. uh, kind of put North Korea into the table to finally uh, end this uh, conflict. Like he talked about like, and he was talking about her like, oh, I'm going to rain uh, fire and fury and, like the world's never seen. And like they look at him, they think, this guy looks crazy enough to actually do it. <laughs> Maybe. The, anyway, but in a sense, I guess I'm less interested. Trump is an interesting character, but I'm less interested in Trump than in trying to guess what's happening to the country and, and whether the pattern of division, which has been seeing, seemed to be very strong, whether it's really there or whether it's significantly an illusion created by the internet and the fact that it is now pretty easy to only interact with people you agree with. And to some extent, that's always happened geographically, that you'll have a, a, a town where everybody's a Republican or everybody's a Democrat. And of course, that's the only reasonable position, according to those people. But I think it's happening in a sort of a non-geographical form now. And, and, and things online are in a sense more visible than ordinary conversations. So you may, we may be exaggerating it a lot. It's, it's, you know, a, 500 people are a tiny bit of the population of the country, but they're a pretty sizable Twitter mob. Right, yeah. What's your uh, guess on, you know, there's the doomsday clock. How close are we to our, uh, like secession clock, right? <laughs> I don't think that's very likely. That would be an interesting, you know, if you're thinking about science fiction stories, uh, it would be fun to try, and people have done that, of course, to try to imagine. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that, it's not clear to me that countries as big as the U.S. make sense. If you think about Europe, I think trying to turn the EU into the United States of Europe, which is why what a lot of the EU people have been trying to do, is a mistake. Right. I think it would work much less well. Uh, and the United States is already the United States of America, and maybe that was a mistake, and maybe it would be better if we could divide into you know fifty different fifty small countries, uh, provided you could do that with sort of free trade and friendly and not fighting wars on the border and so forth, which maybe I, you can do. I could see uh, a fiefdom for uh, David Freeman out in California. You already have a lot nope. of experience out uh, in Penn State. Nope. <laughs> I, I have no desire to run, to run things. Uh, <laughs> the, back when I was active on Usenet, I remember uh, one of the people who I was arguing with who thought the reason I was in favor of anarcho-capitalism was that I really knew it would turn into uh, gangs of bandits sort of controlling things. And I thought I'd be one of the gang, one of the leaders of a gang of bandits. And it struck me as very unlikely, but as both that I didn't believe that's how an capitalism would turn out, but also if it did, I didn't think I'd be one of the winners. But no, the, I, I could go under a David Freeman World War banner. No, uh -huh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, the, so there's all this talk about civil war possibly, and you don't think that's a, a likelihood scenario? Um, like it's very hard to reject anything if you're, if you're willing to go well into the future. Yeah. But I don't think a civil war in the next uh, four years is at all likely. Mm. I think that, that I think it's unfortunate that Trump is going to claim he lo that he really won whether or not he did. And I think I could predict that in advance that part of Trump's image, as it were, is as a winner. And 
given that image, if he loses, he's going to pretend he won. Uh, and that could increase divisiveness. On the other hand, there are, I think, a fair number of people who think that Nixon won the 1960 election, mm. uh, that that was stolen. But the uh, Bush and Gore uh, went up until December 12th. Yeah, and that was another one where, which ended up, I think, with a noticeable number of people. And in, for that matter, Trump's first election, that the whole Russia stuff was partly an attempt by people who didn't like the result to claim it hadn't really happened, that it was, it was really stolen. And, and the attempt to argue for that it was the popular vote and not the electoral vote that counted uh, was, 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 again, an attempt by one side to claim they hadn't lost. Uh, you know, somebody was commenting at some point during this election when, it, when he thought that briefly it looked as though Trump was ahead in the popular vote and behind in the electoral vote, that it would be very funny if it ended up that way, uh, given all of the pressure of people who say the electoral college is a terrible thing, would they suddenly flip their position if the outcome came out the other way around? And that would have been entertaining. Uh, so what do you see in a... Um... Biden and Harris, Kamala Harris presidency? I think Kamala Harris is much more worrisome than Biden. Yeah. Uh, partly because she's much younger uh, and is going to be around for a longer time. One of the things that struck me, by the way, is that people are making this big point about the fact we have a black vice president. We have not yet had an Afro-American, either white, white, either president or vice president. Right. She's All right. Uh, Obama has African ancestry, but it's African ancestry from Africa, not from slaves. And Kamala Harris comes a little closer because her father is West Indian. So very oh, likely he did have ancestors who were slaves, but not slaves in the American South. That was a, a different system. Um, so in fact, we have not yet had in that sense, an Afro-American win, even though people claim they did. And that's, you know, in a sense, the whole way we define uh, racial groups, as it were, is pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, that, for example, I suspect that if Kamala Harris's father had been white, she would still be counted by people as black. Right. Because her mother is Indian. Right. And in, in, I, don't know, I don't know where her mother is from, but Southern Indians have very dark skin because they're adapted to a high sunlight environment, just like Africans are. Uh, and so for some purposes, people think of them as black. And if you believe there's prejudice against blacks and the prejudice is by people who only look at the skin color, then that's a relevant category, category but it's really in some sense not a very interesting one. Uh, and For all it's worth though. <laughs> yeah, the, well, Thomas Sowell, in Ethnic America, which is a very interesting book, if you haven't read it, points out that West Indian immigrants are quite successful in the U.S. That his, his figure, I think, is that the average income reaches the American median in one generation. Right. And he points out that that's evidence of both of the standard explanation of why American Blacks do better. All right, there are two standard explanations for that. One of them is racism. And one of them is genetic inferiority. All right. Well, as, as I think Sowell puts out, West Indians are blacker than American blacks on average. That is to say, they have less uh, white intermixture. They look darker. So if the real reason is racial prejudice, they ought to suffer from it at least as badly as Americans. Right. Furthermore, since they're genetically more African, if the real reason is that Africans are genetically inferior, they, West Indians, ought to be more inferior, and yet the West Indians do fine. And he concludes that none of those explanations is consistent with the evidence. He's probably right. You can look at, um, sometimes they'll make the point, well, you know, it's a generational thing and generational wealth was lost and stolen. And, but you can look at uh, the Jews, for example, after World War II coming here with virtually nothing and it just takes uh, two generations and they bounce sure. up to like 1% again. Yeah. Um, Hong, Hong Kong, uh, just post World War II, has got to be one of the poorest places in the world. And by what? I suppose by uh, 2000 or so, per capita income was higher than England. So, so no, I think, I think that does not make sense. Uh, I think Sowell's explanation is cultural. It's, and this is by memory of a book I read a long time ago, but it's an interesting theory. His idea is that, uh, South, is that slavery in the American South 
was really in a sense like like uh, socialism in the sense that the slaves were being ordered to do this work, do that work. Uh, whereas the slavery in the West Indies was much more like serfdom. That is to say that the slaves had his piece of land, he had to do a certain amount of labor for the master, but other than that, he was running his own life. And the argument was then that that produced a much more self-reliant functional culture. Whereas if you are a slave in the South, what do you do? Well, you figure out how best to game the system. How do you steal from the master or how do you please the, the master or whatever, but you're not really learning to run your own life in the same sense. So I don't know if he's right or not, but it was an interesting theory at least that you would develop different cultures and that one of them was much more functional. Now, I think the other point that I think he makes there not really contrasting the West Indians, but contrasting other migrant groups, that he points out that for lots of, of migrant groups, the initial reaction is very much like to, the, to, to American blacks. That is that the people who are already there say, well, they're obviously ignorant and stupid and you know, have all sorts of things wrong with them. And then in a generation or two, the Irish are just like everybody else. Uh, right, I, and part, part of his argument is that the blacks, the relevant immigration for the blacks is after the Civil War, and especially in the early 20th century, coming up from the South into the North. And that by the time they're doing that, you've got much more of a welfare state society. You have a something where it is the, the set of incentives that result in immigrants working themselves up uh, have, have broken down a lot, uh, and therefore they had the bad luck to do, to do worse than other immigrants. groups. Anyway, Ethnic America is an interesting book. Soul is obviously an interesting guy. Yeah, uh, I love his work. Uh, great guy. I think he was talking about also how before the Great War on Poverty, Blacks uh, were doing remarkably well. Uh, you look at like single parent motherhood were r ridiculously low at a very low percentage rate. Um, yep. Pretty rate for them as well. Uh, but you can probably look at like, yeah, the, the war on poverty interfering with their new uh, cultural beginnings to kind of like a lot. The, the, the data that struck me a long time ago is that from world, the end of World War II to about the point when the war on poverty gets fully funded and staffed, the percentage of the population that's poor is going steadily down. Mm -hmm. From that point to the present, it stayed roughly constant with the numbers going up and down with the general economy. Uh, and I think that's true. I haven't looked, I, I, I looked at these numbers years ago, so I don't swear it's still true, but it seemed to be. So as you may know, if you've read Losing Ground by Charles Murray, his description of what happened, which I think is right, though I'm not sure, is that the original idea of the war on poverty is to actually end poverty. That is to change things such that the people who were poor would no longer be poor, that they'd be employed at reasonable wages and so forth. They made various attempts at that, and none of them worked, uh, and job training programs and such. And so it got converted into a program to make being poor less unpleasant which was much easier to do because you can, after all, spend money on giving people food or, or, or money or whatever, but that that has the unfortunate effect that you then tend to keep poverty rather than, than destroying it. So, uh, no, I think that may well be correct, but, but in any case, I'm not sure. Right. Reminds me, have you ever heard of the Lumbee tribe? I think they're in North Carolina. They're in the Carolinas. Nope. They're the only Native American group that don't have federal recognition. Uh, mm -hmm. but they don't receive any money. Um, yep. There are the only Native American groups in this country that own banks, uh, make mansions, uh, businesses, an enormous thriving community. How do you spell that? Uh, Lumbee, L-U-M-B-E-E. -E. L-U-M-B-E-E, -E. that's interesting. I know nothing about them. No. They might, people's connection to like maybe the lost uh, um, colony of Roanoke that uh, intermixed with the Native Americans there. Yeah. Uh, people are like, well, what happened to them? They're like, well, you found Native Americans with blue eyes, you know, so. Maybe. Right. Maybe. <laughs> one, of, one of my general rules for looking at history is that any historical anecdote that makes a good enough story to have survived on its literary merit should be viewed with suspicion. Hmm. Uh, and uh, that's true of lots of, lots of, it's true of some of the medieval nonsense, some of the things people believe about the Middle Ages when they say, well, look, uh, the armor was so heavy that a knight had to be hoisted onto his horse. That's just silly. Uh, and 
very, but I think it's also true often. Sometimes what's going on is the historical anecdote uh, supports one political position over another and right. therefore is popular. But sometimes it's just, it makes it such a good story. And that, that, I mean, I don't know the whole, the whole Columbus myth, for example, the idea that Columbus was the scientifically correct person who knew the world was round and that all his critics thought he'd fall off the edge is complete nonsense. Right. That, a, a spherical world had been scientific orthodoxy by that time for most of 2000 years, basically since uh, late antiquity. Uh, and the real difference was that everybody else knew how big around the world was and everybody else knew about how wide Asia was and they could do arithmetic. And it was perfectly clear that if what Columbus claimed to be doing after all was getting to the Indies, and it was perfectly clear that the ships would never make it. And they wouldn't. If you think about, you know, he barely makes it to the new world. Well, there's another, what, two or 3,000 miles of America and then half a world worth of Pacific. Right. Uh, he would have died early on. And I like to think of that, like, where do those um, myths come from? And I see, like, I look at it as propaganda myths. Uh, probably well, it is. That, 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 but, but it's two things. It both makes a good dramatic story. And because it's a much better story if he was right, and then look, he discovered America. Right. Whereas if you say he was wrong, and by pure luck he survived when he should have died, that's not as good a story. Uh, but in addition to that, it's a story, moderns like to imagine their own superiority. So there's a tendency, I think, for moderns to like stories which show how stupid people were in the past, mm -hmm. because that means we're better than they were. And stories of that sort, of which there are a lot, uh, therefore tend to get to get promoted and I think that's that's one of them but it also just I, mean, I don't think it's an anti-catholic story in particular because it's supposed I mean it, it, like to like uh, like none of his journals were like kind of surviving there's there's writings about him writings that he put out but like they like to write and misinterpret some of the things he wrote about uh, the natives like he's talking about enslavement but he's talking about like there would be great servants for God now they talk about like, well he went to prison no he went to prison because he uh, chastised and reprimanded his own men for the mistreatment of natives. Uh, Maybe. I don't, I've never gotten into the question of whether Columbus was a good guy or a bad guy. I have only gotten into the question of whether he was a, somebody who was scientifically right or scientifically right. right. The whole it's possible, of course, it's possible, of course, he was just lying. That is to say, he, he may have been a con man. It may be that he, in fact, suspected that the new world was there, because after all, the Norse had already been there. Right. Supposedly, <coughs> there's at least the claim that Basque fishermen had been fishing cod off the east coast of what's now Canada, uh, and therefore had some suspicion there was something there, or they hadn't gone all the way. So it's possible that, 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 that Columbus suspected that there was a large land mass somewhere much closer than Asia, and he said to himself, I can never sell this story and get funding for my ships, but if I tell them we'll get to the wealth of Indies, the... Mm -hmm. Royalty are not very educated people, so with luck I can sell them this story. Uh, so that might be, it's possible that that was what was going on, in which case he wasn't, in which case he was a con man, not, not ignorant. But, but I think it is more plausible that he believed his own, his, his own Kool-Aid, so to speak, as people often do. Right. Uh, but, but anyway, I say, but it just seems to me that, that but similarly, your, your, your lost colony of Roanoke, it isn't impossible but it makes a good enough story so that I'm suspicious. Right, and, and, and later they find uh, Native Americans with blue eyes. It's like, well, we can kind of put two two together. They're kind of close to each other. There's kind of- But again, with the implication that this tribe did so well because of the white intermixture, one of the things people don't usually tell you when they're making arguments about racial IQ is that Amerinds average higher than Europeans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Asians also have higher uh, IQ. Yep. A, 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 Asians do higher, and the Amerinds presumably are ethnically Asian if you go back far enough, though it's way far, but it's believed that they came across the Bering Straits from, from the northeast corner of, of, of you no, know, so, you know, right, northeast corner of Asia, just trying to see a world map in my head and try to avoid getting turned around. Uh, <clears throat> so from that standpoint, it isn't terribly surprising. But anyway, uh, I mean, yeah, no. tangent I have is like, like, well, then what is, uh, what made the West so great if other culture groups have higher IQs, like Hong high Kong, for example, I think, or like Japan quick to industrialize uh, or like, uh, like Hong Kong, an island of sweatshops to skyscrapers and yep. 
could be then these Western ideas coming into that. Yeah. Yeah. Wrong. It, it, it could be, but clearly, again, that's something where everybody with an opinion also has an axe to grind, or almost everybody. And I'd only say, I don't know. That is, it's clear that it's quite striking. Who's there? But there are other quite striking things, that, that after all, the original Islamic triumphs are extraordinary. If you, you know, imagine that somewhere around 1950, there was a religious preacher in Mexico, and he raised a religious movement, and when it was over, they had conquered all of America and half the Soviet Union. That roughly would be the modern equivalent of what happened with Muhammad. Right. At Moha, the, the Arabs are bit players. They're various groups that occasionally ally with one of the great powers, the great powers being the Sassanids, the Persians, and the Byzantines. And what happened within 100 years of Muhammad's death, I think roughly, they've conquered all of the Persian Empire and half the Byzantine Empire. Faster than the time rate of Rome conquering. Oh, yeah, much faster, yes. Uh, so... You know, if you want to argue that Islam is great, you say, look, God was obviously on their side. Uh, there's, there's a 14th century North African political scientist, Ibn Khaldun, and he has my favorite uh, solution to the problem of evidence against your theory. He has a political theory in which there are these long, slow cycles for reasons he explains. And he then says, uh, how could this be fit the original history of Islam? Because all of these things happened very, very quickly. And he says, ah, the answer is this was a miracle. Hmm. That God put courage in the hearts of our people and fear in the hearts of the enemy. And it is a well-established principle of philosophy that scientific laws don't have to account for miracles. Right. Isn't that a wonderful sort of Trump card, get out of jail free kick card for when the evidence comes out against your theory. All right, we can reverse that. The Christians needed that adversity, needed Spain from uh, the kingdom of Astorius, needed a fight to make them strong enough to eventually be in Spain, but to conquer the new world and bring Christ there and to uh -huh. end the pagan sacrifices to, you know, Montezuma gods of the thousands, right? You can, you can generally fit uh, in, in a variety of ways, but, but, but in any case, uh, as I say, I, I have nothing against grand theories of history, but I don't think that any of them are all that convincing. They're interesting speculations. My first published economics journal article was the theory of the size and shape of nations, in which I tried to explain the map of Europe roughly from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present in general form. And I had a theory. I like the, it was, I think it was a very nice theory. It might even be true. Uh, but, but I, but, but it clearly is not going to be a complete explanation. Lots of things happen that, that don't fit the model I'm using. I think I remember reading that. Uh, you get yep. university, you're like, under, did you write there when you were an undergrad? Or? No, 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 no. I was, I was a, uh, Faculty, I, I was a fellow of some sort at University of Pennsylvania at mm. the Fells Center at University of Pennsylvania when I, when I wrote that article. So it was when I was in the process of switching from physics to economics. Uh, yeah, while well, changing. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I like to say the only thing I get out of being a theoretical physicist is I can do non-mathematical economics and people won't think that I'm afraid of mathematics. <laughs> Uh, but. So saying like, um, so you're not a uh, too concerned of a Biden presidency then? You're not no, too... I'm not. I was, as I say, I was concerned with either candidate if they had a blank slate, if they had both houses on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably more concerned with Biden than Trump on that, but either way. Uh, but no, I think that, that you know, if Trump, if, if, if Biden drops dead in six months and Kamala Harris becomes president, I'd be more worried. I think she's more likely to be a sort of aggressive, oppressive entrepreneurial type. She's a cop, more or less. Uh, but on the other hand, whoever is president, they are going to take the lesson of this election as being the, the sort of left-wing story we were telling is not as convincing to the voters as we thought it would be, and we had therefore better tone it down a bit if we want to win the next election. That's my guess. I do like um, the idea you're talking about stalemate, pretty much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
yeah, well, I think, you know, it'd be even better if you had a, had a president and Congress that did good things, but I think that's past hoping for. Right. Probably will be for quite a while. Uh, uh, so they don't do any? The, the, the only candidate I was really in favor of in this election was there was a libertarian senatorial candidate. Uh, I'm trying to remember which state, but it was a state where the Democratic candidate had dropped out. So it was a two-person race. I think uh, it was in Arkansas. And I think Arkansas, it was you're right. It was Arkansas. Against Tom Cotton, maybe? Correct. And actually, I, I still haven't seen the actual results. At one point, he was polling like 30%. Uh, and I figured the chance of his winning was still very close to zero, but it would be quite neat. And it was especially neat, it seemed to me, if you ended up with a divided Senate, if you ended up 50-49-1 uh, uh, or uh, with, with the 49 being the, 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 having, having the vice president as well. So it was really 50-51. Mm. <laughs> and then you would have a Republican swing vote in the Senate. But it, that struck me as something you know, sort of like a, uh, like a meteor, a meteor striking both candidates or something that, that it was not very likely, but I am curious as to how he did, because he sounded very good. That is, I'm wondering whether he'll be the next libertarian presidential candidate because uh, he, he, certainly his positions uh, were much, from my standpoint, much better than the than a fair number of, of libertarian presidential candidates that they had. Uh, he seemed like an attractive guy, as far as I could tell from the stuff I saw. That was the only, that was the only, only race that I gave money to. Oh, uh, wow. Wow. I gave him the, whatever the, the maximum was you could contribute. And, uh, what do you think about, uh, you made an interesting point a long time ago where you were mentioning uh, maybe like the fertility of the Libertarian Party. Like say that their platform does get exciting, does get popular. Um, the competing ones will just adopt it. Kind of yeah, like that is part of it. I think that from my standpoint, I don't think it is very likely the Libertarian Party will ever become a major party. It's not logically impossible. You know, the world's a complicated place. But I think that the sensible strategy for that policy, for that party, is to try to get enough votes for Libertarian positions so the other parties decide to selectively steal the positions. So if it turns out that there is a position that fifteen uh, percent that that fifteen percent of the voters feel strongly enough to vote libertarian on that position, that would be a good reason by both the Republicans and the Democrats should seriously consider adopting at least a watered down version of that. So, for example, something's not going to happen. But if you, if there was enough sentiment for completely ending the war on drugs, that 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 would be a good reason for the major parties to think about being in favor of legalizing marijuana, right. which is a much modest, more modest version. And no, I've been arguing for a long time that the Democrats should try to steal the libertarians. That is to say that traditionally the libertarians were most, the most devoted Republican. And I think the reasons for doing that have been getting gradually weaker over time in terms of the changes in the Republican party. Uh, and I think are even weaker with Trump because his two signature issues were immigration and trade, both of which from my standpoint is on the wrong side. Uh, and therefore what the Democrats should be doing is saying to themselves, are there any issues that our base wouldn't hate that the libertarians would like enough so a bunch of them would vote for us? And the relevant libertarians here are not just the LP voters who are a very small number, uh, but the 10 or 15% of the electorate who are libertarian in the weak sense of saying, we think there should be less government control of the economy and there should be less government control of social matters. Uh, and if you could make yourself more attractive to those people, that could give you a shift of a few percentage points and a few percentage points would have changed the outcome of this election. Right, there has been an interesting, uh, numerous uh, resolutions that were passed this week of like very anti-drug resolutions like in Oregon. Um, Yes, the, the, I think there are about four or five states that legalized marijuana, and Oregon has legalized possession but not sale of basically everything. Right. Uh, and the, but of course, they, 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 that doesn't make it legal because there are federal laws as well. Mm -hmm. So that the position that I would hope one of the two major parties will take, and the Democrats might even take it this time, I'm not sure, is to repeal the federal laws, in particular on marijuana, and say it's up to the states. Right. 
My pitch has always been just stop criminalizing possession of property, whether it be guns or whether it be drugs or anything. If you don't do anything bad with it. Well, except that they, they're still going to criminalize sales. That is marijuana, at least in this part of the country, you can grow yourself if you want to. Uh, but uh, most of the other drugs you have to buy from somebody. And so you get almost the same effects if you criminalize sales. It's not exactly the same. Uh, but decriminalizing possession is certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, the, Do you think any, that there's um, a place then for the Libertarian Party at the very least to kind of... Oh, yeah. I think the Libertarian Party clearly has a role. Mm. But its role, as I see it, is using the political mechanism to get publicity for libertarian ideas. And hopefully, what they haven't done very well, generating evidence that those ideas are popular with some noticeable minority. And they haven't done very well because they aren't popular with a large enough minority to matter, unfortunately. That's our, that's our job, so to speak, to right. uh, your job and my job to, to spread the ideas. What about um, the other uh, question I had would be a libertarian caucus and the Republican Party that produced someone like... Or Ron the Democratic Party. Right. The, yeah. in some, I was noticing in something that I actually had a blog post, I think, a long time ago, that uh, at some point I was talking to a local congressperson from my area, and I suggest a Democratic force. And I suggested to her that the Democrats should be trying to pull Republican voters out of the Republican Party, and that one th way of doing it would be to support legislation eliminating the federal law on marijuana. And she said, yes, uh, I and some of my colleagues have introduced such a bill. Hmm. It, didn't, it didn't happen. But it seemed to me that, that there are people in both parties who on some issues are more libertarian than the current norm. And that it makes sense for libertarians within both parties. Uh, you know, I, I can certainly see libertarians who are sufficiently turned off by features of Trump. So they say, well, you know, the Democrats are pretty bad, but the Republicans are worse and they're gonna work in the Democratic Party. And there have always been libertarians in the Republican Party and there, there still are, obviously. Um, so no, both of those are also useful activities. There are lots, one of the mis <coughs> mistakes that I think ideological partisans tend to make is to assume that there's one right, one right strategy. That if you think about all the time that libertarians spend arguing with each other or socialists spend arguing with each other, it, part of what's going on is that you convince yourself the way we get, the way we solve the terrible problems of the world is to do X. We have some limited resources for our movement. And if you're doing Y instead of X, you're wasting our resources. Mm -hmm. All right. Therefore, I got to persuade you to do X. And I think that's one of the elements in a lot of internal controversy in political movements. And my view, both as an economist and as a libertarian, is there is no X. That what you ought to be doing depends a lot on you. Mm -hmm. That uh, I don't think I would, I mean, I, I worked for a political campaign once when I was in my early 20s, I guess. One that was obviously not going to succeed. It was a Republican campaign, I should put in a solidly Democratic district in about would that have been the late 60s, I guess. Uh, but, but generally speaking, if somebody persuades me the only useful thing to do is to elect candidates, I'll say, well, go elect candidates. That's just not something that I do. If, I, if on the other hand, you're the sort of person who really enjoys the sort of ins and outs of politics and you know, uh, talking to voters and designing press releases and stuff, and I say to you, yeah, that's a waste of time. The only useful thing to do is to be a professor and to change academic ideas in our favor. You're not going to do that. You'll do nothing. So that the mistake is imagining that there is a pool of libertarian resources rather than resources that belong to individuals. And the individuals will allocate their resources to things based partly on whether they will help bring a free society and partly whether they're things they enjoy doing. That that one of the points that strikes me uh, about, again, about political activity in general, is as an economist, you say, why does anybody bother? That after all, if you spend lots of time and energy trying to get, say, a Republican candidate elected, there is a, he might get elected. There's a very small chance that you make the difference to whether he gets elected or not. And if he does get elected, there's a very small chance that one member of the House of Representatives will have any real effect on what happens. So why do people bother 
to put in, you know, large parts of the community. And part of the answer is, I think, that there are side benefits. That the people who do that either are people who enjoy it as a game. There's a line in one of Heinlein's novels uh, about some uh, double star where he's, it's something like, you know, politics is corrupt and evil and this, but it's the only game worth playing for grownups. Hmm. Uh, there are people who feel that way. Furthermore, if you work for a campaign or for that matter for Students for Liberty or lots of other things, you are interacting with a bunch of people who share a lot of your values, are engaged in a joint effort with you. Well, that's a way of making friends. Might even be a way of finding a wife. Uh, that there are sort of a whole bunch of, of social payoffs, as it were, uh, side payments. That, that a lot of the way public goods get produced, public good in the economic sense, which doesn't mean a good produced by the government, it means a good where the person who produces it can't control who gets it. And that's a real problem because the normal way we incentivize people to produce things is you produce it, it's yours, you can sell it, somebody else will pay you for it. Well, that doesn't work if what you're doing is making the country a, free, a freer country. Uh, so you need other incentives. And a lot of the way that works, I think, is that there are related benefits that are private goods, such as the fun of the political campaign or such as uh, making new friends, spending your time talking with people who don't think you're crazy, things like that. Uh, but that's different things for different people. So uh, if you're somebody who really likes doing sort of uh, economic theory, well, that's a rewarding activity. If you do a good job and if the economics points to the right direction for us, you'll help bring liberty, but you will also get a good income being a professor. You'll have a lot of fun making up ideas and talking and sharing with other people and so forth. So, so I think you want to think not in terms of what's the right strategy, but only what's the right strategy for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be different answers for different people. Right. Yeah. Um, kind of reminds me of that one uh, example talking about like the benefits of being a uh, guitar singer is not so much the paltry pay, but the attention you get from the ladies. That's uh, right. <laughs> no, no I thought that if you think about uh, teachers in particular, I'm thinking now mainly of K through 12 teachers and the standard story is they're terribly underpaid and all of this stuff. Now, first, they aren't terribly underpaid, at least when I looked at the statistics. Basically, uh, school teachers made above the median salary for the U.S., but below the median salary for college-educated employees, which, of course, all of them are. Uh, but then they also aren't random college-educated employees. Uh, my impression, at least when I was in student, when I was a student, was that the people who end up uh, majoring in education are probably tend to be the ones who wouldn't pass the courses in engineering or math or economics. Put that aside for a moment. If you think about it in terms of sort of what determines people's willingness to do it, one of the things people really value is status. If you are a competent K through 12 teacher, you are spending a large part of your life in a room where you're the stat high status person, hmm. where you are the person you are listening to, you're the authority, if you're good at it, if you're bad at it, it can be pretty miserable, of course. But but if you're if you're reasonably good at it, uh, so that's that's worth quite a lot, uh, and it's a pretty respectable profession. So you get some status in the outside world as well, uh, but in particular, you get status with the kids. Uh, so that's probably one of the reasons people are willing to do the job, even though it's obviously got downsides like other jobs as well. Right. Uh, so what's your uh your tactic, what is your uh, activism? Or, uh, uh, I write books, I give talks, and I used to teach courses. Uh, I believe one of the projects I have no connection with is the attempt to start enterprise zones, to start little free market enclaves in relatively poor countries. Oh, cool. like, Unless I am mistaken, one of the academics leading that is an ex-student of mine. Hmm. Uh, one of the academics who was very active in arguments against gun control is a friend and ex-student of mine, hmm. John Lott. Uh, and uh, so you influence people right. uh, by spreading ideas. And on the whole, writing books is probably more powerful than teaching courses because your books get read by a lot more people than took your courses. 
uh, and let me give you one, one example of what, what I have done, not all that intentionally. And that is that a lot of the reason that countries have tariffs is that the argument for tariffs that is wrong is much easier to understand than the argument against it that's right. That the argument that's for tariff that's wrong is what economists think of as the theory of absolute advantage. The idea that trade, uh, first that it's a good thing if you sell more than you buy. That's what's called a favorable balance of trade, which is a silly term, but a very popular one. Uh, and the idea that the whole idea of competitiveness, the idea that if our people are better at doing things, we'll be able to sell them goods and they won't be able to sell us goods. And seeing why that's wrong is not, it's not trivial. That it took, it basically understanding the economics of trade doesn't happen until the early 19th century with David Ricardo. And David Ricardo was an extraordinarily smart guy, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but I came up with a way of explaining it, not picking it up, of course, which anybody can understand. Uh, and that is, the way I put it, is growing Hondas. We have two technologies for producing automobiles. Everybody knows about one technology, you build them in Detroit. The other technology is you grow them in Iowa. How do you grow automobiles in Iowa? Well, you grow the raw material auto, auto, automobiles are made out of, which is called wheat. You put the wheat on a ship, you send the ship into the Pacific and it comes back with Hondas on it. Hmm. From your standpoint, that's a technology for building automobiles just like the other one is. You could imagine that somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, there's a big machine and you pour wheat in and automobiles come out. Japan is that, is that machine, so to speak, but the fact that Japan doesn't really affect it. From your standpoint, there's just two ways of using American resources in order to produce automobiles for Americans. So when somebody says we're putting up a tariff to protect American auto workers from Japanese auto workers, he's wrong. They're putting up a tariff to protect American auto workers from the competition of American farmers. Right. And it's exactly like the case. Imagine there are just two different technologies, which there often are for producing the same thing. Uh, it's like saying we, the one that can produce it cheaper, we will put up a tax on them in order to force us to use the more expensive technology. And thinking, and that's what you're doing when you say we have a tariff, which means that that when that ship goes out, it's got to pay some extra money. So that means that even if we can produce a car with fewer American resources by growing it than by building it, we still build them instead. And that's a way of getting people to see why the standard arguments are wrong. And it's a way which I think is fairly easy and intuitive and makes a good story. So that would be an example of my trying to change the world hmm. by creating ideas. Uh, and I created lots more ideas, but most of them aren't ones that you can describe that simply. Uh, and, and I know it works in the sense that if I Google for growing Hondas in quotation marks, so that it's just that phrase, first 20 hits I get are all mine. That is, they're all people who are citing my story. Right. That's great. Um, what do you think of the idea in terms of like tariffs? Like how do you stop a country from putting tariffs against you? Like, I think that's the whole Trump thing, right? The whole Trump thing is like, well, you threaten them with tariffs. That's the claim, but in fact, you don't end up with free trade in practice. That is, right. uh, but no, you're right. Logically speaking, uh, just like dropping bombs on people doesn't make you richer and does make them poorer. And in fact, it makes you poorer because you've got to build the bombs and some of your pilots get killed in the process. Nonetheless, it may be the right thing to do if that's the only way of keeping them from dropping bombs on you. Right. Uh, dropping but, bombs and just... Stop but, but, but Trump, as far as you know, has not in fact succeeded in that. I don't believe that in, for all of the talk, we, have, we did not end up with the Chinese saying to Trump, all right, let's make a deal. We'll have free trade. You have free trade. Didn't happen. Didn't it work with Europe, though? I think there were, I think some of the stuff were with Europe in the first year or two. Um, and don't know. I didn't, I did not follow that. So I, so I do not know. Right. But I mean, my view is what we should just do is saying, well, no reason to shoot ourselves in the foot. Uh, let's just abolish all our tariffs, have free trade, and let's try to persuade other people to do it. That's what England did in the 19th century. And it was a very successful economy at the time. It's what Hong Kong did uh, in the 20th century. 
I think that's kind of like what uh, New Zealand did with their farmers, where they got together and they said no more subsidies for farmers. And huh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Now, New Zealand is an interesting case. Uh, as you may know, it's in a sense the clearest case of a country that abandoned uh, left-wing interventionist policies. Mm. Uh, and it did it under a labor government. Mm. That basically New Zealand had a very interventionist sort of wealth, welfare state, regulatory state kind of system. And it had gotten bad enough that a lot of the population could see that it was making them poor. And they had a, uh, a labor party politician who apparently was a very sensible guy. And he said, let's try, you know, cutting off the puppy, the puppy's tail all at once, not an inch at a time. And he made a big swing the other direction. It was very popular and succeeded. Hmm. Now, New Zealand is still not a libertarian paradise by any means, uh, but it's a whole lot better from the descriptions I've seen of what it was 50 years ago. Uh, and, and he did it, you know, unlike Chile, it did not require killing people or arresting people or a coup or anything of that sort, which is nice. Uh, uh, it's one, day, one day I'd like to invite you on the show to talk about Chile. And, uh, I don't know enough. I don't know the, enough. You should, you should have people from, from Chile uh, to uh, What would like the Chicago economists uh, persuasion afterwards and how there were, yeah, the people claim that the people who, who, who argued for that policy were my father's students, which isn't really true. They were Chicago students, but they were really Al Harberger's students because he was the person in the department who was specializing in economic development stuff. But, uh, but yeah, no, as far as I can tell, uh, when, uh, Pinochet came to power. He initially uh, followed more or less the same kind of economic policies as had been going on in most such countries, and they worked rather badly. And he was then persuaded uh, to have some young, uh, relatively young Chilean economists who had studied in Chicago to take their advice. And he moved fairly rapidly in a pro market direction. And Chile went from being a not particularly rich country to being, I think, the richest of the South American countries. Yeah. Uh, but now it's swinging the other way for political reasons. Yeah, uh, that's so upsetting. Uh, my, my daughter has a couple of Chilean friends who she uh, interacts with online uh, pretty regularly, and they're pretty, pretty negative on what's happening now. All right. Um, but, thank you. I want to say, like, I've taken like a great hour of your time. And I really, good. you're right. That's fine. I enjoy it. It's an opportunity to spread ideas and talk, and it's a relatively low cost way of doing that. So, <laughs> uh, I like your idea of stalemate. That is that is interesting. Uh, yeah. Gridlock not- government, <laughs> right? Gridlock. Yes. Government. Right. I think that's a interesting way to kind of put, it or maybe to kind of ease some concerns. Concerns, right? Yeah. Um, I think. Um, I guess we'll find out in the next few weeks to come with what happens after that. Um, I, I will be very much surprised if it turns out that there's good enough evidence of either mistakes or vote stealing to reverse the result. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but you know, an awful lot of the judiciary was, it, it is people who were appointed, appointed by Republicans. And even if uh, a lot of people don't much like Trump, a lot of people don't like uh, the Democrats either. So I think if there was really clear evidence that would come out, uh, despite attempts to hide it. Uh, now, one of the things I've been saying for quite a while about the Electoral College is the Electoral College system makes vote fraud much harder. Hmm. Because the easiest place to do vote fraud is in a one party state. All right, if the California Democrats want to steal votes, it shouldn't be very hard to do so. But it doesn't do any good to steal votes in a one-party state because you're going to get all the electoral votes, however many votes you get. So therefore, the electoral college system reduces the incentive. Now, the problem still exists if you have a one-party city. But if you have a one-party city in a balanced state, which is the case where you want to steal votes in order to get those electoral votes, then the state government is not loyal to your party. uh, And that means that it's going to be not impossible, but a good deal harder to get away with with, with vote fraud. So, So I think... In the discussions at the Electoral College, I haven't seen anybody else bring that up, and yet it seems to me it's one of its very real virtues that it makes the vote fraud harder. Right. So you would say uh, things go smoothly, but if they don't, we would know 
because we'll see you at the range with the new AR-15 uh, or AR-16 rifle. And <laughs> you know, like, you know, I like, I like, I do like your honesty and you won't me see, you won't see me at any shooting range until the uh, pandemic is over because I am <laughs> 75 years old. And right. if I get the pandemic, I've got about a 5% chance of dying and I really don't want to die. So I am being very, very, very careful at this point. Yeah. Yeah. My general view is that the appropriate response to the pandemic is that some people should be very, very careful and other people shouldn't. Right. Yeah. Your uh, chance of dying is very low if you get it. Right. Yeah. It, it's still going on and it's not, it's, it's different for everyone else and kind of like in terms of their own politics or activism, uh, make the best choice for yourself. We hope. Anyway. All right. Bye bye. So much, uh, Dr. Uh, David Freeman. I really appreciate your time here on the show. Um, for those watching, stay liberated. Print guns, not money. <laughs>